first chapter of the book, essentially. All right. So digital forensics is retrieving evidence from a computer that records what's been happening on that machine. Now, it turns out you could in actually install surveillance software on computers that deliberately record what you're doing, and that is becoming more popular as bosses in the days of remote work like to put spy software on your machine to make sure you're really working and not goofing off. But even if you don't install any surveillance software, computers do in fact record an incredible amount of information about everything you do, not deliberately, but coincidentally. They're recording it to help make the computer run better and to help it adapt to be easier for you to use, but the end result is it does keep a lot of information about everything you do, and that means if you're doing anything on a computer and you want to lie about it later, you're in big trouble because a competent forensic examiner can find a lot of evidence. And when I took a, my, some of my computer forensics training courses, one of my instructors warned me that his class had caused four divorces because he taught people how to use computer software and for their first homework they would go home and examine their home machine. And many of them would find that their husband or wife had been playing around without them knowing. And it's a, um, it is, if anybody's doing anything on a computer, it is very easy to find out what they've been doing and very hard to hide that evidence. So, um, there are accepted practices to gather this and uh, all right, and the original form of forensics that was developed was for helping the police and the court of law and all these related fields are based on the same kind of activity. So you can find incriminating evidence, inculpatory or exculpatory evidence, which is evidence that somebody did not commit a crime, either way. So it's not the same thing as computer security. Security is just bringing about the state where something is trustworthy enough that you can use it, and computer forensics is particularly about gathering evidence on a machine. It's related, but it's not the same. Um, and, and like I say, you can use it to investigate computer crime or any other kind of crime. Every crime these days has digital evidence, even if it's a crime that's not computer oriented at all, like a car accident, there's going to be surveillance videos and GPS information and cell phones at the scene and all that stuff, and all those have evidence that you want to get off of them. Um, and you can recover deleted files to some extent, although less than we used to. <coughs> now that most people are using SSDs, most of them do not let you recover deleted files. Back when everybody was using magnetic hard drives, it was a lot easier to recover deleted files. So here's kinds of evidence to get. One kind is email. Email has a special legal place, and this is part of why you hear so many arguments about the law of computer data. Um, the law is very slow to, to adapt. And once you put up a law, it lasts for a long time, so a lot of laws are really badly written and not applicable, and in particular, email. The email law was written decades ago. At that time, computers were really small and really weak, and nobody would leave their email on a server. The servers weren't big enough to store all the data, so you would have a program like Outlook Express, and every time you booted it up, it would download your email and delete it from the server and put it on your own drive where you would again delete it pretty soon because there wasn't much room. And so the law was any, day, any email that remained on a server for longer than well, I think 120 days was considered abandoned and you could now inspect it without a search warrant. That is no longer the case. Now everybody has like a Gmail account and they just leave their email at Gmail all the time forever. So email has been there for 120 days is not really abandoned at all, but in the eyes of the law it is and it can be examined without a search warrant. So. That's the kind of thing that tends to happen. Um, so email is, of course, very valuable because it has a name and it has a chain of events so you can see what's been happening. And it, 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 it lasts for a long time, typically. And uh, like I say, it's not necessarily subject to a search warrant. Here it is, 180 days old. Um, if it's more than 180 days old, you don't need a warrant to examine it, which is probably very point very inappropriate, but it is the way the law is. And the Electronic Frontier Foundation in San Francisco is a real important organization. It's basically the ACLU for the internet. They are the organization that tries to push for privacy laws and secure technologies to protect people from unnecessary government um, invasions and spying. And they're very useful in that regard. They're very intelligent. They have a bunch of lawyers that help people and uh, highly recommend supporting them. They're a big celebrity in all the hacking and security community at every security conference the EFF is there giving talks and getting people to donate and stuff they're uh, they're the only thing really that pushes back against government surveillance in America um, 
All right, then there's images. Images are really important in court because they're very easy for the judge and jury to understand. If you just get a picture of somebody doing something, then you don't need to argue about a bunch of technical stuff. So there's a bunch of formats for images. Another thing about images is they often contain metadata, like the GPS location and the date and time that they were taken, which is extremely useful, and many people don't know that. So um, that can lead to people uh, leaving a real trail of everything they do, even more than they realize, in the images in their phone. And video, of course, is the same. Um, surveillance video and other videos people have. Uh, closed circuit video is, is video transmitted to a particular location. Um, but these days, a lot of people use internet-based video surveillance that goes to a cloud service, sort of like iCloud or something. And that's a whole record easily obtained with a court warrant order. Um, and again, video can be very compelling because you don't need to have any technical knowledge to understand. You see somebody walking around doing something. It's easy to understand what you're seeing. All right, so um, then if you, the uh, internet searches and the web history in your browser is something many people understand too and often quite useful. Your computer is making a web request to a web server and getting the web pages delivered and all that is being recorded. Your internet history records everywhere you go. There are, uh, there's a cache in your browser that stores pieces of images and pages even when you're done looking at them and there's just a lot of records kept. And cell phones, are a huge area. We'll have quite a few projects here where you examine data taken from cell phones, Android and iPhones, and most people, their whole life is on the cell phone, and um, if you analyze the data there, you'll find out everything, all their phone calls, instant messages, emails, photographs, the GPS locations they've been going to, you know. You wanna know what somebody's been doing, their cell phone is probably gonna tell you everything. Uh, all right. And uh, then there's Internet of Things is the next step forward. Now we have more and more intelligent gadgets. I was just doing a podcast uh, yesterday about um, in smart light bulbs. I don't know why people do this. People buy smart light bulbs now. Now the light bulb's recording everything. And you can hack into the light bulb and get all that data off. So it's uh, your toaster, your light bulb, your car, everything is now smart. And all those are full of evidence that can be collected. Um, all right, so if you want to be a digital forensic investigator, the main thing you need, of course, is IT knowledge. You need to understand how computers work, how storage system works, file systems and networks, and so on. Understand the forms of encryption that are used. And uh, then you can answer questions, like finding out who was using a computer, um, finding out whether there's evidence that they deliberately went to a website, or was it just some malware going and go there. Knowledge of Linux is important. Um, Internet of Things devices and cell phones all run Linux, even though a lot of computers, although not much on the West Coast, run Windows. Um, all the smaller devices are pretty much running Linux these days, and the Macs are running Unix, which is pretty much the same thing. So you need to know both Windows and Linux. Um, all right. And uh, then a little bit of the law, a knowledge of the law is necessary, certainly not enough to be a lawyer but enough to understand the rules of evidence and so on. Um, we'll talk about the uh, chain of custody quite a bit. You have to be careful when you gather evidence to secure it and keep records. So you can go to court later and say, oh, I gathered the evidence and I made sure that nobody tampered with it right until now, blam, here it is. You have to have an unbroken chain of custody with human beings that can testify and say, I made sure nobody was tampering with the evidence, otherwise the evidence loses most of its value. And, all right, and we'll also talk about the Fourth Amendment search and seizure limitations and so on. Let me check Twitch and see if there's questions here. Um, yeah, there is a module for each chapter. Uh, there was a big controversy over TikTok presenting a national security risk. Um, well, and do I think the CCP could have backdoors? That is certainly possible. They could have backdoors. In fact, um, we're now supposed to not use Chinese hardware in any of our military or government systems because even more than the software backdoors, they can put hardware backdoors in your processors and other equipment. That has happened, and it's almost impossible to detect it when that happens. One of the um, cases I heard about that was that one of the Arab nations around Israel purchased missile defense systems from Israel. And when Israel attacked them, those systems mysteriously failed to detect the Israeli missiles. So you certainly could do that. That is technically possible to program a chip to ignore a certain category of threat. Um, I don't think they ever proved that happened, but it certainly could happen. And um, so I don't think it's been proven that CCP has put backdoors in TikTok or other programs, but they could. And um, that's why a lot of people want to ban it. They're just afraid that it could be used to harm us. 
uh, but they haven't proven that it did harm us. And this is where you reach a sort of difficult question, like, you know, Donald Trump wants to put a 10% um, tax on everything, and he wanted to block stuff from China entirely. And other people say you really shouldn't punish them until you prove they've done something wrong. You shouldn't just say they might do something wrong and punish them. And uh, nobody knows what the right answer is here. There's no... Uh, uh, foreign countries do not have any right to sell things here. It's up to us whether we want to let them sell things here. But in general, America has tended to have open markets to try to get the cheapest product from anywhere. And we could switch to a more paranoid system, which seems to be where we're going, where we in, don't let people immigrate much and we don't accept foreign stuff coming in very much because we're more concerned with protecting our borders than from being open, an open society and having the best people get in easily and the cheapest products get in easily. These are two different positions we can take. And we seem to be moving from the open free market model to sort of the paranoid closed model. Um, whether we should be there, I don't, I'm not, I don't know, but that's where we're headed. Anyway, um, the issue of using TikTok is the data could be used, yeah. Also, um, other people are worried about the propaganda value of TikTok. They could program it to spread pro-Chinese, anti-American messages and poison the minds of our youth. I've heard a lot of people say it's going to do that. Um, now people have blocked it on government computers and cell phones, and uh, a couple of states have blocked TikTok. I know, um, I think Utah, or one of, one of the Midwest states blocked TikTok, and all the uh, TikTok developers said they're going to have to lose their job now. People are making money on TikTok. Well, of course, all they have to use is a VPN, and they could continue to illegally use TikTok from there, but they're not willing to do that, so unless they want to move out of the state, they have to stop making their TikTok videos, which apparently you can make a lot of money on TikTok. Yeah. TikTok they opened their software to one of the EU countries. They they gave the source code to an EU country. Yeah, they opened up the source code. Yep, opening up the source code might help. Um, um, it might help. I don't know how much it'll help, but you know this is why we'll have. Uh, congressional hearings and everything else as they decide exactly what they're afraid of and what they're going to do about it. So far, the U.S. government has not banned TikTok, and I highly doubt that we can get organized enough to do it, but we'll see. Anyway, um, all right, another thing you have to have is communication skills. You need to be able to make a clear written report of your findings, and you need to be able to testify in court to your findings, and that's about giving a clear, confident explanation so people can understand about what you've done. And so, uh, and also knowing more languages is very helpful in the modern world as we get more and more multicultural and bilingual and so on. And the main thing in any kind of tech field is you have to keep learning forever. Um, that's why I'm here, I think that's why most of us are here. It doesn't get boring. There's always new exciting things happening. Um, and of course, any security professional at all must be able to keep things confidential. Just like a doctor or a lawyer, you will become if you work in this field, you will learn non-public information. Like you examine some data that has been seized under court order that is only to be used for a certain purpose. You're not allowed to leak it to the media or gossip with your friends about it or something, and, and you have to understand that. So I've uh, several times in my courses, I've discovered vulnerabilities during the semester, and I've had my students sign non-disclosure agreements so we can talk about these new vulnerabilities before they've gone through their disclosure timeline. And if you work for a company, you will have to sign a non-disclosure agreement and you will learn their internal secrets and so on, and that's just part of the job. You have to be aware of that. Um, so in the 80s, the FBI created a magnetic media program that sort of got us started in the world of computer forensics, and the Congress passed the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, which is the one used to punish most hackers, which says you are not allowed to connect to a computer and download data that you're not authorized to have. So you're not allowed to hack into a computer and discover its secrets. Um, in the 1990s, the Secret Service launched the Electronic Crimes Task Force, which is uh, connected to the Secret Service. I'm a member. You can be a member. They have very interesting meetings. And um, until recently, require, one requirement to be a member is you had to never work on the defense side of any prosecution, but only on the prosecution side. But uh, here, understand they've relaxed that requirement, which I'm glad to hear because that seemed a little dishonest to me. Um, and then, uh, anyway, it's a good group to join. And they started the Regional Computer Forensics Labs. There are a variety of these in locations in the United States. And um, they've put out quite a few tools. We'll use some of them later. We'll at least talk about them. Uh, then the Patriot Act in 2001 expanded the um, ability of the government to gather evidence in cases of terrorism. 
And then cryptocurrency became popular in 2010, starting with Bitcoin, moving on to Ethereum and all the others, and this made it much easier to collect money online without passing through the visa or, or banking systems, and that was used for a lot of illegal transactions. Now, it turned out that Bitcoin is, in fact, a really terrible thing to use for illegal transactions because there's a public ledger recording everything. There was a period of a few years when law enforcement didn't understand how to de-anonymize it, but now there are several companies like Chainalysis that provide that service. They will de-anonymize Bitcoin transactions and let you find out who's been doing what. And they so the gov it got so powerful that a couple of years back, when I think it was the Russians hacked colonial oil to freeze oil shipment all through the east coast of the United States. Um, they paid a ransom of like $30 million and the US government managed to get almost all of it back, just grabbing it back off the blockchain. So uh, the government is actually getting quite good at de-anonymizing and manipulating Bitcoin. There are privacy coins, or that would be almost impossible, like Zcash, but they're not popular. Most criminals continue to use Bitcoin and Ethereum, even though they're not really anonymous and they're not really protected from government interference. It's a little bit harder for the government to reverse things than it would be if you went through Visa or MasterCard, but it's not impossible at all. Yeah? How good are those uh, cryptocurrency mixers? It seems like the government still can prosecute people for using, for using the mixer. <coughs> yeah. Yeah, the cryptocurrency mixers, if used correctly, would protect you. In a cryptocurrency mixer, you have a bunch of people putting money in, and it's just like putting water in a pool. You mix it up, and then they pull it out at different ends, so it's not, that what comes out is not easily connected with what goes in. So if you're able to get your cryptocurrency into a mixer, and the mixer runs, then it would be nearly impossible for that to de-anonymize that and get it back. Um, yeah. Right. Yeah, they didn't get the stuff into the mixer, I think. The you know, mixers can't handle a large amount of money. The problem with that couple in New York is they stole a monstrous amount of money, like $5 billion. No, they, 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 they tried to like, make money from, you know, to, to, uh, to launder the money. To they tried to launder it, but they were incompetent. Uh, it's a small amount of Bitcoin, but then the Bitcoin value go up, so they end up into like $5 billion. Yeah. Anyway, I know they were unsuccessful in laundering it, and they finally just got caught, and the government got it back. And the Colonial Pipeline, it appears that they actually moved that money through Coinbase, which is a, a legitimate company and cooperation with the government. I think that's how the government snatched it. So in many cases, it's cryptocurrency, if you used it very carefully, you could use it to move money and avoid governments. But if you're not smart, you will end up going through areas where the government can still grab it, and that's what happened. Um, all right, anyway, uh, let's see if there's more comments here. Um, is there a problem with Huawei? Yeah, yeah, Huawei has been banned, the Huawei components, on the same grounds that they had a lot of vulnerabilities and people don't trust them. Uh, does that task force require security clearance? It does not, because I don't have one. In order to get the Electronic Crimes Task Force, you have to pass an FBI background check, which is not a security clearance. All it is is checking to see if you have, like, felonies on your record. Yeah? Yes, they have. They did promise something like that to work with Oracle, and one thing that the Trump administration wanted was to force them to sell to Oracle, and so some of that might happen. This is what Scott Galloway says. He says probably the TikTok will accept being sold to an American company in order to make the profit. Uh, but right now, they're independent, and the government has not yet forced them. They've been talking about it for years. But um, our government is, in fact, so divided over other issues, especially now, with the real theatrical stuff happening in Congress, it's very likely that they will get distracted arguing about Hunter Biden or something and never come back to actually doing anything to TikTok. Um, it, anyway, uh, so Edward Snowden in 2013 publicly revealed secret NSA spying capability that shocked everybody. It turned out that the NSA had been regarding American companies as adversaries and hacking into them for years. And they had put spy software inside Yahoo and Google and everywhere, and they were getting everybody's email and everything, and people didn't know this. So it was considered a huge scandal. Snowden revealed it publicly. He fled to Russia, where he lives now and is basically never coming back. Um, and. Uh, 
He faced terrible legal problems here because he was a military contractor under a non-disclosure agreement. He absolutely had agreed not to talk about this stuff, and then he totally talked about it. And his lawyer said, please stay in Russia. Don't come back here. I don't want to try to save you. There's no saving you. The only way to save him would be a presidential pardon. And Obama talked about it, and Trump talked about it, and neither of them seemed very sympathetic towards it. I don't think Biden's sympathetic either. His best plan is to stay in Russia. Anyway, the point is he revealed how bad the security practices were at American companies, how the NSA was hacking into everything, and that led people to upgrade their security from TLS 1.1 to TLS 1.3, which has perfect forward secrecy, which is a huge improvement. So now every single session going to a website has a different key. So even if the NSA manages to steal one key, they can only decode one session of traffic. They won't be able to decode future sessions of traffic without finding a way to steal the new key and that makes it all much more secure. And that was largely because of Snowden that revealed that the older versions of encryption had all been completely compromised by the NSA. And so there's a lot of places you can go to get um, computer training and computer forensics, including classes here and many other places, and there are professional certifications. Um, there's a couple of independent ones, and there, SANS is an organization that has all kinds of certifications, including forensics. They are greatly respected. They're also very expensive. A SANS course will cost you like five or $6,000. So you normally don't take that until your boss is paying for it. Typically, if you get a good IT job, your boss will give you a training budget of $5,000 a year or something, and then you go to a conference like Black Hat or something and spend your training budget taking a fancy course. I teach those sometimes, not SANS, but other ones. Um, anyway, there's also industry certificates. The main one being NCASE and ACE. NCASE, the two most popular forensic products are NCASE, which is used by most police departments, and Access Data, uh, FTK, which is used by the FBI. And they're both very good products. They're both very powerful. They're both very expensive. Uh, the large version of it with all the features you need can easily be $50,000 or more and the police agencies pay for it, and people often hire expecting you to have one of these. So becoming a case certified examiner or an ACE certified examiner is a good thing to put on your resume to get this job. Um, this course does not prepare you directly for either of those. We cover generic features of computer forensics, and we use free open source tools because we don't have access to the uh, software to make you an case certified examiner. That would be a good idea, but we don't have the ability to set that up here. So. That's the first lecture, and I've got a, um, a uh, Kahoot to look at. Let me see if I can find it. Yeah, here it is. So uh, this is mod one. So this is just an online quiz. It's worth some extra credit if you get the most right, if top three. So if you want to do it, open up a browser and go to kahoot.it and put in that number and a name, and you can compete. You get three points if you're in the top three, and it can add up. Um, some people don't like it, but most students find it keeps them awake to do this sort of game show-like thing. Electronic Crimes Task Force. It's well worth joining and attending their meetings. Yeah, Red. Definitely wait a bit. Lots of people still coming in. All right. Let's give it a shot. All right, 
what kind of evidence contains GPS data? like we've improved it. Okay, so it's images. Images typically have GPS marks in them. All right. All right, what evidence can you collect without a search warrant? Email is considered abandoned after 180 days. All right, what skill is useful for collecting evidence from Windows? Scripting language for modern Windows systems. Very good skill to have. And which one of these is a computer forensics certificate? but only in case is related to forensics. The others are general IT. recording.